possiamo incominciare i nostri lavori. Benvenuti, buongiorno, eh, grazie a tutti quelli che sono venuti qui in sala e che ci stanno seguendo online. Eh, lasciatemi appunto ringraziare in modo particolare Matteo Lanzafame, Marcella Zaccagnino, Pasquale Scaramozzino per aver accettato il nostro invito e un grazie particolare a Grimaldi Alliance per essere stato nostro partner in questa iniziativa, aver ospitato, ospitato il nostro incontro in questa sede così prestigiosa. Eh, il, centro, il CESPI, eh, il Centro Studi di Politica Internazionale, è un think tank che dal 1985 svolge un ruolo sempre più fondamentale in un mondo in cui la complessità è cresciuta in modo esponenziale. Allora il ruolo di un istituto come il CESPI è quello di svolgere un'attività di ricerca e di studio, ma anche creare occasioni di approfondimento e dibattito, come quello di oggi, eh, al, con l'obiettivo di fornire ai diversi stakeholder coinvolti elementi utili eh, per definire strategie e poi prendere decisioni. È un compito non semplice che richiede un'attività di ricerca solida, capace di coinvolgere soprattutto i tanti attori e i diversi punti di vista che concorrono a definire una situazione o un processo in corso. È un lavoro ampio che si avvale di un sistema di relazioni e di professionalità, anche multidisciplinari, che il CESPI ha costruito negli anni e continua a costruire quotidianamente. Eh, L'Asia rappresenta un'area centrale delle dinamiche internazionali, non solo per la presenza dominante della Cina, verso cui è cresciuta l'attenzione geopolitica in modo particolare in, questi ultimi, in quest ultimo decennio, ma l'Asia è anche una realtà molto più articolata e complessa, che non si esaurisce nella sola presenza cinese, è spesso percepita in Italia come più lontana rispetto ad altri scenari più prossimi. All'interno di questo contesto eh, così ampio e articolato che il CESPI ha scelto un punto di osservazione, l'India, il paese che ha superato la Cina per numero di abitanti, un'economia destinata a crescere nei prossimi anni, con una struttura democratica che comunque rimane radicata, seppure in evoluzione, quindi un mercato potenzialmente importante. Ma l'India ha anche un ruolo strategico e geopolitico rilevante, è crescente all'interno dei BRICS, in quello che si definisce il Global South, è una potenza emergente che sta eh, cercando di trovare e costruire una sua postura internazionale. Eh, ma è anche un paese con profonde tensioni di carattere religioso, etnico, legate alle disuguaglianze e un processo di transizione energetica non semplice da gestire. Per questo abbiamo pensato di creare l'Osservatorio India, uno strumento che consente di aprire un focus specifico su questo Paese, cercando di comprendere le dinamiche interne per a sua volta comprendere eh, le scelte di politica estera. L'osservatorio vuole essere un luogo di ricerca, ma anche un luogo di dibattito, di informazione, coordinato e coordinato da un sistema di relazioni e di partnership ampio a 360 gradi tra studiosi, enti e organizzazioni che si occupano di India in Italia e in India. Um, un lavoro uh, che è supportato e coadiuvato da, da un gruppo che abbiamo chiamato Gruppo degli Esperti, alcuni di loro sono qui presenti, li ringrazio, Stefano Manservisi, Mario Pezzini, Pasquale Scaramozzino e Michele, Michele Guglielmo Torri. Sono esperti con profili diversi, eh, la cui interazione rappresenta il motore dell'attività di studio dell'osservatorio coordinato da Sergio Lugaresi, che è qui al mio fianco, fresco della sua esperienza come Executive Director presso l'Asian Development Bank. All'interno di questo percorso abbiamo eh, deciso di eh, organizzare questo primo evento di lancio dell'osservatorio, approfittando della pubblicazione poche settimane fa dell'outlook eh, dell'Asian Development Bank, grazie appunto alla disponibilità di Matteo Lanzafame, grazie mille. Ehm, Un'occasione un che ci permette di collocare l'India all'interno del contesto asiatico e delle sue prospettive geoeconomiche. Eh, credo sia un'occasione eh, importante e rappresenti il primo step necessario per comprendere la postura e le dinamiche di questo Paese. E, a questo punto io eh, darei la parola al, al professor Chaudone, eh, partner del, del Grimaldi Alliance, eh, che da tempo ha sviluppato una parte in India, e, e ringraziando per l'ospitalità. Prego. Grazie Daniele, e scusatemi se non sono lì con voi in presenza come avrei voluto per partecipare alla giornata di oggi ma 
delle iniziative col CESPI e saluto Piero collegato anche lui da remoto purtroppo eh, sono sempre una, un importante stimolo eh, per noi per avvicinarci ad aree nelle quali operiamo oramai da tempo eh, Grimald Alliance vi do un, così, un piccolo flash su cosa siamo diventati su cosa stiamo facendo eh, siamo oggi presenti in nove città italiane eh, Roma ovviamente la nostra sede è quella che che avete la fortuna di vedere, io sono nella nostra sede di Cruzzello oggi, eh, abbiamo poi eh, Napoli, Treviso, Padova, Verona, Torino, eh, Milano e eh, Bari e Parma, a breve avremo anche eh, Bologna e Catania, abbiamo poi le sedi estere di eh, appunto Bruxelles, eh, Parigi e Londra, nonché una serie di partnership che ci consentono di operare in oltre 60 paesi, nel... in particolare siamo presenti in India, con un partner con il quale collaboriamo oramai da oltre quattro anni e riusciamo a garantire proprio nei confronti di un paese così eh, grande, eh, sicuramente oramai il più popoloso al mondo, ma anche complesso nella sua diversità, nella sua eterogeneità, eh, un, con un supporto legale importante eh, alle imprese estere che operano, e italiane in particolare, che operano. Devo dire che iniziano ad essere importanti anche i casi di investitori indiani che hanno a che fare con controparti italiane e in generale sono presenti sui mercati internazionali. Quindi l'esperienza che noi possiamo mettere a disposizione grazie appunto ad un approccio multidisciplinare eh, che è quello che come Grimaldi Alliance stiamo portando avanti a livello nazionale e internazionale è proprio quello di eh, cercare di avvicinare eh, una, una, una realtà al paese di, queste, di questa rilevanza, di queste dimensioni. I livelli di crescita sono noti a, tutto, a tutti, 6-7% se non sbaglio, ma eh, ci sono importanti economisti che potranno darci. Ma ci sono importanti economisti che potranno darci un dettaglio di prospettive di crescita, che sono già probabilmente il 7%, e in India, dal punto di vista politico e dal punto di vista finanziario, play an increasingly important role as a market and as an international investor. And uh, the idea of having an observatory and uh, also uh, the fact of having offices that are somehow close to, uh, uh, for instance, uh, cooperation, well, this is a fundamental choice. So we want to be an infrastructure that allows the different realities uh, from the different countries in which we operate. Well, Uh, with support we are willing to accompany investors and financial operators in uh, their activities and we want to do that in a steady uh, way so it's not just a matter of uh, uh, finding out today let's say the relevance and importance of uh, india <laughs> nella nostra sede di Roma e continueremo a farlo. I miei We will continue to work. Parteciperanno ai lavori e collaboreranno alla discussione sicuramente. And of course we have uh, some colleagues that will uh, contribute uh, to shed light on uh, the financial and uh, uh, economic opportunities but also from uh, let's say the possibilities in terms of investments in uh, uh, economic Uh, situations and settings. Il rapporto con un paese oramai sicuramente centrale nel, nelle dinamiche geopolitiche. La rilevanza economica sul piano forse generale ancora non è stata pienamente valutata, ma sicuramente la nostra esperienza professionale è oramai eh, ferma nel ritenere che la collaborazione tra eh, operatori presenti in Italia sicuramente verso uh, l'India, ma anche imprese indiane che devono svolgere le loro attività nel, nel mondo, è una necessità, così come lo è stato ad esempio negli anni passati in una città, eh, dove siamo presenti con il grande studio del mondo, i che è parte della nostra alliance, e con gli Stati Uniti, che sono mercati di dimensioni enormi, ma non inferiori a quelle del, del, dell'India. Io vi auguro un buon lavoro e vi ringrazio per averci coinvolto nell'organizzazione di questa giornata di approfondimenti su un tema così eh, importante e direi... Grazie mille. Un'altra domanda? Sì, sì. Grazie mille. 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 Grazie mille.
Thank you. By taking advantage of a break uh, in the activities in uh, Parliament, I would like to give the floor to Piero Fassino, honorary president of CESPI. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Daniele, and also thanks to uh, uh, Mr. Chaudone, and uh, thanks to uh, those that uh, contribute uh, to this meeting and contribute to the activity of the observatory. And also thanks for the experience and the system of relations we have in place. Just a few minutes because I, I'm in uh, a break at the uh, uh, Chamber of Deputies. And uh, uh, in any case, I wanted actually to, uh, to be here and uh, I wanted to express my full appreciation and uh, we all know, of course, that Asia is important. We know that it's an important continent, needless to reiterate. But mm, very often, it is considered that the heart of this uh, uh, important, uh, let's say, continent is represented by China and uh, also Japan of course, reasons, because Japan has been historically an amazing power. Over the last few years, however, it emerged something that led us to work um, also uh, in uh, um, anything that, it, that is related to India. So India is uh, uh, a country with an amazing uh, financial and economic development. It has uh, a very high level of population. Uh, India is undergoing a steady growth of its GDP and uh, growth rates are between 8 and 10% per year. And India is an important protagonist of global economy and also a uh, protagonist that uh, is uh, of course, showing some political ambitions. It is one of the BRICS countries, together with Brazil, Russia, China, and South Africa. And recently, on the occasion of the latest uh, summit of BRICS, these countries have decided to extend, uh, let's say, to other relevant countries in the global south. And uh, one of uh, uh, the uh, very last meetings of the G20 was held in India, and uh, was a place of uh, uh, particularly uh, relevant uh, debate when it comes to climate change and international trade. And also during that G20, it was possible to see uh, how uh, important it is to have a shared governance uh, of the world. Um, and uh, actually with the uh, G20, there was no, let's say, uh, final statement uh, on uh, the uh, war uh, in uh, Ukraine. So uh, this says a lot. Uh, but in any case, India is a strategic country from the financial point of view, from the political point of view, and from the strategic, let's say, point of view. And Italy um, is uh, uh, in India represented by nearly 600 com um, companies that operate on the uh, Indian market. And at the same time, and as Mr. Chaudhon has said, there's a growing commitment by Indian companies uh, towards um, a number of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, activities, including uh, Great Britain and uh, the um, financial markets around London, but there are also um, situations like uh, Italy, in which we have a growing number of uh, companies and financial operators that look at Italy uh, uh, as a, an area of interest. And India is also committed in a broad program of reforms aimed to modernize the country from the industrial, uh, for instance, uh, and uh, transportation, healthcare, and uh, agricultural point of view. So the main goal, uh, is uh, linked to the uh, technological uh, side and to turn India in, into a um, manufacturing uh, and technological hub. So there's a financial dynamism 
uh, by reiterating the central role in the global economy. So all this leads a country like Italy to, of course, deal with India. Europe has to deal with India, of course, but within the EU, Italy has, of course, an important role to play when uh, it comes to India. And Italy and India uh, signed at the time of the uh, Draghi government um, specific cooperation agreement and there was the idea of uh, um, reiterating this uh, specific, uh, let's say, uh, uh, cooperation. And both countries may benefit from this specific cooperation. So Chespi decided to take care of this specific aspect. And in the same way as we generally deal with uh, the uh, uh, countries uh, that uh, play a major role. For instance, we, uh, as just we deal with Turkey, just to make an example. And uh, uh, in fact, there's another country like Turkey that wants to reiterate and affirm its uh, For this reason, it's very important to underline the relevance of uh, uh, this uh, uh, activity, the system of relations uh, by uh, Mr. Lugaresi that allows us to be sure that an amazing activity will be carried out. So I wish to thank uh, Mr. Shaudone uh, and the Shaudone firm and uh, all of the uh, stakeholders and uh, I wish for a fruitful meeting and apologies, but I'm a member of parliament and uh, I, of course, need to attend uh, sessions, especially when we have to vote as today. Thank you. At this point, Daniele, sorry, if I may, uh, I wanted to share with you an interesting information if we look at the CEOs of 30, 40 uh, largest companies from India, like Alphabet, Microsoft, YouTube, World Bank, IBM, Palo Alto Network, Novartis, uh, Starbucks, uh, etc. And uh, this is an interesting information that allows us to. Uh, let's say, fully understand the economic analysis, because it gives a clear idea on how the presence of elites, the Indian managerial elites, is a global presence. And this confirms what actually Mr. Fassino said before. That is to say, we cannot, uh, let's say, treat India uh, as a uh, let's say, an evolving uh, situation. Uh, they are a reality. And uh, India certainly um, has, uh, let's say, managers far more than uh, China and Japan. And uh, Indian uh, uh, managers are uh, present in different, uh, let's say, business uh, areas. And but this is important also in the considerations we may make uh, in relation to the medium to long term. Yeah, thank you so much. This is definitely important for us to know. And I would like now to uh, give the floor uh, to Sergio Lugaresi, our coordinator, who will uh, guide us through this afternoon. A couple of practical housekeeping information uh, because uh, um, English uh, translation is available, and uh, please use the Q&A if you want to ask questions to our speakers. So now the floor to um, Sergio, uh, who is the coordinator of uh, the India Observatory for Chespi, and uh, he, is, he recently uh, completed his mandate at the Asia Development Bank, and uh, he actually yeah of the last few years so please well 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, welcome. And thank you for joining us. Many things were said already. And we already obtained a few uh, uh, results uh, by increasing awareness on uh, the situation around India. So the ambition we have as an observatory is to uh, provide analysis and information on this large country. And we shall not forget, however, that we also have to set a framework in which defining the information that can be useful to operators and enterprises. So our ambition is not to neglect the institutional side, the legal side, and the history and, and the set framework of this country and these topics. Let's start with the economy, which is definitely important. And we do that by means of an approach uh, that we'll continue to use. That, it, that is to say, a Zoom that may, let's say, uh, uh, act as a lens, uh, so a broad vision of the uh, uh, region. It's like the movies in which you see the Earth and then you zoom out to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, clearly showing the uh, the window of a house. And uh, also by presenting the Asian Development Outlook, which is the main publication of the Asian Development Bank, which Italy is member of, together with other uh, European countries. And I was the executive director for a group of, it, of uh, European countries, including Italy. And that is where I met Matteo. And uh, it is the most important publication, which is done once yearly. And then there are two updates which are provided. And also, it is the outcome of the analysis of economists of the Asian Development Bank, but also of the operators that actually operate on the field. And also, it comes from the discussion with the authorities. So it comes from an important activities in terms of uh, collection of information, and it allows to have a clear picture of the region and understand the role of India within the region, and also uh, to set the framework of the country within this framework. So I'd like to give the floor to Matteo Lanza Fame, which is Principal Economist at the Economic Research and Development Impact. The and uh, uh, of course, the names of the... That's why I'm reading. So please, Matteo, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, particularly for inviting me and thanks to everybody for attending this meeting. So. Uh, the uh, introduction has just been uh, provided uh, when it comes to the Asian Development Bank. I can skip this phase. Um, the only thing I would like to show is that you will find a link uh, to the uh, landing uh, page of the Asian Development Outlook. So hopefully, uh, if you're interested in reading the report and have materials and figures, everything is contained there. The subtitle of the report I think I'm uh, having 20 minutes for my presentation, but stop me if, stop me if I'm um, So uh, this is robust growth amid uncertain external prospects. So last year, what we call, uh, of course, developing Asia, including 46 countries, which are member of the Asian Development Bank, ranging from uh, Central Asia to the Pacific. So actually, uh, this is a rather broad overview. So the economy has grown by 5% in 2023, driven by domestic demand. And this happened despite of the uh, a weak external demand, because last year the global economy has been impacted by a series of shocks, as we know. And a positive sign is that exports that had a declining trend in the first part of the year have bottomed and are now are 
is starting to go up again, especially with semiconductors that represent an important uh, um, item in uh, uh, Asia. As to the outlook, our forecast is that economy is growing by 4.9% in 2024 and 2025, and this will happen despite of the uh, continuous deflation in the region. So we expect that the inflation rate uh, overall goes to 3.3% uh, 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 up to 3.0 in 2023. So this is the outlook. And these are our forecasts, but there are some risks that uh, entail negative risks in particular, which are linked to the conflict in the Middle East and uh, geopolitical tensions, uh, uh, the uh, path of US monetary policy, and also of the situation relating to the real estate market in China, and also the climate, uh, let's say, uh, related uh, issues. So what, what I'll try to do in my presentation is to come to the details when it comes to these main messages. The first slide you see here is uh, a uh, specific representation of uh, uh, demand side contributions to uh, GDP growth. And this uh, growth has been uh, driven by domestic demand. So if you look at the dark blue of these bars, you will see the uh, internal consumption, and uh, it has remained rather robust last year. And it's been supported in particular by growing domestic demand inside of the virus economies in the second half of the year. As to investments in uh, uh, green, in light green, but this has been quite resilient in particular in countries like India and Indonesia, by upsetting the weakness registered in other countries like South Korea and Thailand. Then if we look at the, uh, let's say, uh, demand from the uh, outside, then you may see uh, in light blue the net exports. Then you see that in uh, the first half of the year, the contribution has been negative. So once again, external demand last year has been rather weak, and uh, it has uh, somehow taken away from the growth instead of uh, contributing positively. But if you compare the first half of the year to the second half of the year, and uh, then we also uh, look at what we see as high income uh, technologies. That is say high GDP or high uh, income. And these are the uh, groups, that is say the new industrialized countries like China, Singapore, South Korea, and uh, uh, Taipei, China or Taiwan. So if you look at this group, you see that in the first half of the year, the net exports have uh, uh, somehow uh, decreased their growth. And uh, this depends on the sacro semiconductors that in the second half last year has become positive. un'occhiata un po' più approfondita al, ai settori industriali e, e dei servizi e ci sono diciamo vari messaggi importanti um, dopo la, la prolungata debolezza della domanda um, esterna nella prima so after protected weakness in external demand in 2023 the industrial and manufacturing activity improved towards the end of the year especially in the second part of 2023. On the left, you see high-income technology exporters and the trend I was talking about, the change in the global cycle of semiconductors appears clear. These countries, together with Southeast Asia, produce and export approximately 80% of semiconductors at global level. Um, 
If we look at panel B, ASEAN economies, we see the situation is a bit heterogeneous. And uh, the demand for electronics has risen. And then panel C shows only two economies, India first, and here we see that growth was stable, whereas for Pakistan, we see the effects of last year's crisis and then a stabilization and a recovery, even though values are still negative. And then on the right, we see another church chart for semiconductor buildings. As to Asia Pacific, it's the light blue line, and you see an upward trend in the second part of 2023. As to semiconductors, we have a special topic in our report. I will go back to it later at the end of my presentation. But basically, the most important driver of this change is the demand for semiconductors that are needed for artificial intelligence. So the trend we see derives from semiconductors for artificial intelligence. So we have seen a continued moderation in inflation. Uh, the first panel on the left here, there's a break down of the headline inflation. And you see it's downward. And this was due to a reduction in energy prices with a stabilization in the first part of the year and a reduction in prices for food products. In the yellow part is the core inflation without taking into account energy and food. And the downtrend is more gradual. So we still have some inflation pressures. If we exclude China, so the averages are weighted for GDP within the region. And China equals to 40, 46% of the total. So when there's a different trend in China, this has a strong impact on the weight average. Last year, China had deflation towards the end of the year. So if you look at the center, the pattern is similar, but higher. And in particular, food inflation within the PRC contributed for 2.7 percentage points, a significant figure, the double compared to the pre-pandemic period. That's And one of the most important elements was the price of rice. And if you look at the last panel, panel C, you see the situation in China. Last year ended in deflation, primarily driven by lower food prices. As to exports, I have already told you something here. You see different part patterns. Exports from Asia have grown significantly during the pandemic. Electronics semiconductor at a global level are produced in Africa, in Asia. So during the lockdown, 
the demand for remote work has skyrocketed. With the reopening after the COVID pandemic, uh, the demand was mainly for services. And then we have another increase last year when China reopened. So they started to export again. But this trend did not last for long. We have another reduction. And the last part of the curves is driven by semiconductors. Without giving you too many details, you can see on the right this breakthrough, electronics in light blue that contributes significantly to the dynamics you see on the slide. And another important element is minerals in orange with oil. I don't know why the title can't be seen. Anyway, uh, this is a slide on services, export of services which represent 15, 16 percent in 2022, 10 percent for China, 40 percent for India. The main element for export of services has been transport services. because there were problems for shipping of goods, goods due to the pandemic. Because of mobility restrictions, the price for transporting a container from Asia to the United States or to Europe has skyrocketed, skyrocketed during the pandemic. And with the reopening, the opposite was true. So these basic effects are shown on the slide. Uh, this is true, especially for China, of course. Financial conditions. Well, the main element which determined the pattern you see on the slide is the monetary policy of the US. In general, financial conditions improved last year, but there are ups and downs depending on expectations from Fed. Toward the end, you can see that evaluations from financial markets increased because we expected Fed to cut interest rates in the second semester of this year. The report was issued, was published April 11th. The cutoff was made a month earlier. So these data refer to the first days of March. The latest data on US inflation are less positive compared to expectations. So now markets think that the first cut will take place in July or September. Some say there won't be any cuts. On the right, you can see portfolio inflows. Pattern is similar. The worsening in July to November, starting from November, some improvements. What is interesting to notice is the breakdown. I mean, in orange, you see uh, flows for China. In blue, the rest of developing Asia. As to China, they are mainly negative, except for the last two months, February and March. 
The reason is that China is experiencing a real estate crisis, and this has a significant impact on investors' expectations. The last two months show that some policies were put in place by the authorities in China, and so the situation is slightly improved. They're trying to solve the real estate problems. Very briefly on debt levels, on the left you have the public debt in percentage for GDP. The main message, well, there are two main messages to take away. First, debt is still very high in China. Sorry, says the speaker, in Asia, if compared to 2019, before the pandemic. The reasons are the same uh, as in Italy and other countries. In order to face the pandemic, countries have invested a lot. So in yellow is the situation in 2023. When compared to the green part of the bars that indicate 2019, the 2023 level is higher in most cases. The positive aspect is that last year, that was reduced by 0.2% in Asia. This was due to higher inflation and to growth, to robust growth. So this is the a general view, but there are four or five economies who have more serious problems relating to debt levels with a ratio GDP um, debt exceeding 100%. Pakistan is even lower, is still lower. For Pakistan and Sri Lanka, they are the two countries who had a crisis last year and where the situation has stabilized now through some agreements with IMF. But these agreements are still to be implemented. Reforms are still to be implemented. So it won't be easy for these two countries. Another country who's having some problems in supporting debt is Laos. Laos has 60% of general debt in uh, foreign currency, mainly dollars. Last year, we had a strong depreciation, interest rates are still high. So servicing debt for Laos is still a problem. On the right, you see the fiscal balance. And we can see there's been some improvement compared to the previous year. Now, the outlook that starts from baseline assumptions. Well, as you can see on the left, in advanced economies, growth will slow down. In 2024 and 2025, with some differences among the three main economies. In the meantime, the deinflation process will go on, passing from 4.5% last year to 2.4% this year and 2% next year. This will be due to a stabilization in the prices of for energy and food and to the lagged effects of monetary restrictions. 
As I was saying, we expect a cut in interest rates in the United States and in the Eurozone starting from the second half of this year, as you can see on the central chart. On the right, we have the commodity prices. And here, as I was saying, there's a price moderation for energy, for food at a global level. The deviation from this trend is represented by rice, whose price has increased significantly last year. And this is very important for Asia. The reasons are basically two. The impact of climate events. I was talking about Nino, El Nino. Rice needs a lot of water to grow and to have good crops. And there are also some trade restrictions, especially from India. India is the main ex rice exporter. And since last year, they imposed a restriction to exports, to rice exports. And this has an impact on rice price at global level. Here you see the most used index in uh, Southeast Asia. So in such countries as Philippines, Bangladesh, rice consumption and rice price has a significant impact on inflation. So very briefly, we expect growth to stabilize at around 4.9% in 2024 and 2025. The sub-regions that will lead growth will be South Asia and Southeast Asia, whereas for East Asia with China, pattern is different, led by a slowdown in China. This year, we expect 4.8 growth in China, and for next year, 4.5. This is a slide I added to show you the weight, the importance of India within the region. Here is the general contribution of different countries, so India, China, and the rest of the region to the general growth in developing Asia. If we compare the average of 2015, 2019 to other years, 2024 and 2025, you can see two elements. China is still very important. Its weight reach, reaches almost 50%. So even if the growth rate is diminishing, China's contribution is still the most important one. But if we look at India in green, you see that India's role for general growth goes from 22% before the pandemic to 25% this year and 28% in 2025. So India is growing. And this is due also to the fact that India is growing faster than China and the rest of the region. So this was to give you a more precise idea of the main growth drivers in India. So last year, well, the years represented are fiscal years, OK? So last year, the growth was 7.6%. The main drivers for this growth were, well, there was a slowdown in agriculture due to erratic rainfalls. Then there's been an industrial growth. Driven by uh, investments. And then services, which contribute for over 50% of GDP. 
and they were driven by internal demand and exports. On the right, you see purchasing managers index, and it's interesting to focus on the last part, I mean, most recent data with a positive trend for the whole period. Uh, more than 50 is an improvement, less than 50 is a worsening. So you see that towards the end of the time lapse, starting January 2024, the trend is even more positive, more upwards. So we expect the situation will further improve. Yesterday, the PMI was published for February, and it's even more positive compared to the data I'm showing you. Inflation, uh, I don't have much to say. Inflation is expected to moderate further in all regions, with the exception of East Asia. where inflation will be, let's say, will have more normal values. And this is driven by an increase in prices in China. Just a few words about risks. We uh, highlighted these four risks, conflict in the Middle East and geopolitical tensions that could lead to a rise in inflation or transport problems the evolution of U.S. monetary policy that could have an impact through exchange rate and currencies depreciation, and then uh, consequences of the crisis of the property market in China, and finally, the effects of El Nino. In the report, there's a debate on uh, mid-term risks with technical details, especially for the first two risks. I have some slides too, but I think I don't have enough time. So thank you. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. Hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers. As you have seen, Matteo must follow some rules, especially with for the names of countries agreed upon within the Asian Development Bank. So you will see Taiwan that is called Taipei, comma, China. This is not an error. It's not a mistake. It was agreed upon. It's the only international institution, whether Taiwan is still present. It's an agreement signed by the Japanese president, but they had to change name. We have the chance of having with us Marcella Zaccagnino, Deputy Head of Mission at the Italian Embassy at New Delhi in India. So I will give her the floor. She will give us an overview also about the relations between Italy and India. Marcella? Buona serata a te. Marcella, non ti sentiamo. Uh, nella okay, migliore perfect. tradizione, nella migliore tradizione di questo. There we go and uh... I just had a, a connection issue with my computer as it happens in these situations and hopefully you can uh, see me uh, while waiting for my Wi-Fi to be back. Well, these are the amazing things from India. Um, so, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, uh, good evening, as far as I'm concerned, because here it's uh, 9. Um, and as I said at the beginning, uh, it's important now to specifically focus on India and on the uh, uh, relations with Italy. Much has been said already 
so I'll try not to reiterate things that have been mentioned. And uh, apologies if I'm going to be quite institutional, but this is my background, this is my role, and hopefully this um, approach will contribute to define a detailed, let's say, picture of India and of the phase we are going through when it comes to our bilateral relations. Let's start by saying that there has been a slowing down which lasted 10 years roughly and that was caused, as you may imagine, by uh, the uh, uh, specific uh, crisis here and it had uh, long, uh, let's say, consequences and uh, it polluted, I would say, the bilateral relations uh, and for many years between our countries. The situation has not improved because then in 2013, after the Eric Alexi, an Italian company, Gusta Westland, has been uh, involved in a corruption uh, scandal and this has further, let's say, uh, worsened the situation. Fortunately, uh, it was possible to work in a steady way to recover the previous situation. And as from 2018, there has been a sharp improvement of our conditions and relations, also fostered by the, uh, uh, let's say, contacts that were established. So every year there have been uh, meetings, uh, um, either in person or uh, by uh, uh, calls. So a positive uh, uh, switch took place in 2020 when Italy uh, benefited from the uh, Indian solidarity after, uh, let's say, being affected by the first wave of COVID. And this helped quite a lot. And there was a big solidarity coming from uh, India, which we have returned in 2021 when India was struck heavily by more than Italy. So the uh, main development took place in November 2020 when there was a virtual summit between uh, former Prime Minister Conte and uh, Indian Prime Minister Ramal Modi. And on the occasion of that summit, an action plan uh, was signed lasting five years, uh, which had the advantage of uh, setting the framework for the pillars of bilateral collaboration between Italy and India, hence uh, by identifying the frameworks in which synergies existed already, and uh, also by relaunching uh, relations through a series of uh, tools. So what are these? Okay. Going through them quickly, political dialogue, bilateral dialogue, and coordination at a multilateral level. So uh, there continue to be actually contacts, political contacts, uh, which are quite regular. And also there's continuity and sharing of priorities in the multilateral approach between Italy and India. The second pillar uh, is uh, financial and economic cooperation, and I will linger on it after. And uh, uh, the two sectors identified by the action plan initially were uh, food processing and advanced manufacturing, and uh, science and technology, the third pillar, and then culture and people to people, which are standard pillars of bilateral relations. But in the case of India, uh, they are particularly uh, relevant. And I'll come to, well, to tell you why this is the case. So, uh, as I said, the virtual summit 2020 marked the relaunch of the cooperation, which was then further strengthened during 2021 when Italy uh, had the presidency of the G20, thanks to which we had in Italy for the first time a good number of Indian ministers to so, uh, presence of Indian uh, uh, ministers, also limited uh, due to COVID. There were very good occasions uh, to establish contacts at a political level. And then there was also July 2021, uh, the mixed uh, economic uh, commission that develops the dialogue started with the action plan that I was mentioning before, 
And then on the occasion of the uh, G20 summit held in Rome, there was a first visit in Italy of uh, Prime Minister Moni uh, that was supposed to participate in a G20 summit, but also a uh, true bilateral meeting uh, with our Prime Minister that was Draghi at the time. And on that occasion, uh, a partnership on energy transition was uh, uh, established, and this is uh, the framework in which Italy may provide uh, some technological solutions and also in terms of regulatory management uh, to help India to achieve one's uh, uh, goals. And for India, it's not just a matter of uh, moving from fossil uh, to renewable sources, but also to increase uh, the uh, amount of energy India needs to support one's growth and also the transformation of its economy uh, that is increasingly going towards manufacturing sector. So it's a matter of matching and combining traditional and renewable energy sources. In any case, there's a true environmental issue and problem in India and uh, the pollution uh, records taking place, well, clearly show it. So there's a big level of awareness based on which it's necessary to go towards the direction of a, uh, a transition that allows to improve these uh, general situations. So once again, strategic partnerships on energy transition, which was very important. And for the first time, uh, the word strategic was included. Uh, and uh, this is absolutely important for us. In 2022, there was a further step forward because there was a visit in India, while well, May uh, 2022 of uh, Di Maio, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs. And uh, of course, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs deals with the foreign affairs and international uh, cooperation, but also international trade. So the visit by uh, former Minister Di Maio in uh, Delhi uh, involved both the bilateral side with the Indian uh, minister, but also a meeting with the um, uh, Ministry for Trade uh, and uh, uh, also a CEO forum was uh, organized with the participation of CEOs from uh, Italian and Indian underlining once again the importance of the financial cooperation of this uh, um, matching or cooperation. Uh, for Italy, 2022 was an important year because it was an increase in our diplomatic presence in India with a new general consulate in Bangalore in the south of India, in what is considered as the uh, Indian Silicon Valley, showing once again the interest by a country to develop and consolidate and deepen uh, the relations with India, and that was a tangible sign of uh, this mutual interest and of the importance that is given to bilateral relations. Then uh, the G20 summit in 2022 with under the, the Indonesian presidency. But in the meantime, in Italy, there were elections, as you know. And uh, in uh, Indonesia, there was the first contact uh, between Modi and uh, uh, the Italian Prime Minister, Giorgio Meloni. And, uh, um, if you um, surf on interested, you will see there were a lot of memes that show them uh, in a friendly uh, attitude. And uh, uh, there's a portion of the Indian population that would like to see them married. Uh, so between the Indian Prime Minister and the Italian Prime Minister, and uh, I mean, Modi, Prime Minister Modi invited uh, uh, Mrs. Meloni to uh, India. And uh, she accepted, and uh, it was quite surprising that accepting this invitation entailed to, um, let's say, go uh, to India at the beginning of March 2023. In the meantime, India had the presidency of the G20, and uh, the visit of uh, Prime Minister Meloni coincided with two important uh, uh, events, uh, that is to say, the uh, Foreign Affairs Ministerial Meeting of the G20, so Minister Tajani was there as well, and also the uh, main 
let's say, um, representative, let's say, in a Sina analog. So Mrs. Meloni uh, was invited uh, as a speaker, and this is an honor which is currently granted to uh, leaders that India considers as uh, absolutely important. So try and imagine that we had to organize all this in uh, uh, one month, but we were very happy to welcome the delegation of Prime Minister Meloni, accompanied by Minister Tajani, and to organize for them a specific program thanks to the collaboration of the Indian Friends. So, as uh, Timayo did, also Minister Tajani met uh, the various enterprises in another edition of the CEO Forum. And also participated in uh, a resident dialogue. And uh, the uh, participation of Prime Minister Meloni underlined the joint vision between Italy and uh, uh, Italy and India, and underlined the recognition that there is a strategic link between the Pacific and Mediterranean. But as to the outcome of the bilateral meeting, the most important development was the, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, the increase of this relationship to a strategic partnership. And this is not to be taken for granted, having considered the past, uh, let's say, situations between the two countries, and uh, it further relaunched the partnership towards a new level of ambitions. And then, besides reiterating the importance of the uh, financial situation, Molto importante, lo spazio, la cyber also uh, space, cyber security, and uh, also a third pillar, there is to say mobility. Mobility as a pillar is also uh, not to be underestimated, and it's important to mention what a lawyer Sharoni said, that is to say the presence of CEOs, Indian CEOs in the main global firms. So the importance of diaspora, of this country is absolutely fundamental, and then the issue of mobility is central uh, in uh, the uh, relations with other partners. And as to Italy, we should not forget that our country is hosting the second Indian community, the second largest community in Europe after the UK, 210 uh, million people. Non contenta, o meglio, molto contenta della visita di marzo, Presidente Meloni decide. Then uh, President Meloni decided to come back in September 2023 for the G20 summit. So once again, the visit was positive, and there was a meeting with Prime Minister Modi, and this visit uh, gave further momentum and allowed to finalize one in October, one November, two, uh, let's say, important agreements. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, the defense, and the second one is the agreement on mobility and migration. So, uh, defense, it goes without saying that this is a fundamental uh, situation because these mm, two, uh, uh, let's say, countries were in a difficult situation after the Maroc case, and uh, also. There were important situations in the area of defense, and uh, um, also uh, the uh, uh, agreement also allowed to further increase the number of workers and students and uh, Indian businessmen that can come to Italy. And uh, what is important now for our country is to have regular flows of qualified labor force contributing to the needs of our labor market, which is going through some uh, uh, difficulties. So these agreements were signed on the occasion of important uh, visits. 
and uh, this shows a, a big level of attention in our country. So 2024, uh, there's a phase of implementation of these agreements. So as to the defense, uh, now there are the uh, to me relations and uh, we have exchanges of, you, of visits at a uh, technical level, high technical level. And in the months to come, uh, there will be two uh, pop calls from two boards, and uh, these will be important occasions to enhance further cooperation in this framework and to relaunch the prospects of our specific companies. And as to mobility, uh, the agreement I was mentioning has come into force on the 1st of April, and uh, we are, for the first time, about to uh, put together the joint working group and uh, to have Indian workers uh, uh, linked to the needs of the Italian market. As to the political cooperation and cooperation, I said it, it's a, uh, it has a frequent contact. And uh, there are uh, some priorities that were identified within the G7, and I'm just briefly mentioning the Global South and the outreach. So, uh, East and West have to, uh, let's say, work so that the divide is not uh, deepening. And uh, then also, another important aspect to consider is that we expect that India participates in uh, the uh, Borgognazia Summit uh, between the outreach uh, countries and the wish is that it is going to continue to uh, operate in uh, uh, let's say uh, um, organizations like uh, a major role also as a dialogue with the G7, G7 plus uh, differently from other uh, players and stakeholders that have a more critical uh, attitude. So what matters is to invest on India also for the role that it can play at this context and in this uh, specific situation. If we move on to the economic and commercial aspects, some figures, and then I'm available to uh, go back to some of them, uh, the trade is uh, performing well. Uh, we are not starting from huge, uh, let's say, amounts because the Indian economy is rather close and entrenched. Uh, in 2023, the Italian export uh, recorded a 7.6% growth by uh, exceeding 5.5 billion euros with, um, let's say, uh, machinery, let's say with 40%. Total uh, trade achieved 14.3 billion with a slight decrease, that is to say, uh, as compared to the record year, which was 2022, uh, due to a, an offsetting and also decrease in the exports, which is uh, in uh, line with the general Asian outlook. There are 700 companies and there are nearly 50,000 uh, uh, workers. And, uh, of course, this is an important contribution to the economy. Then, as to the sectors, the advanced manufacturing and energy transition, as we said, and then uh, the strategic sectors as defense space, which have opened up thanks to uh, the strategic partnership and also thanks to some agreements, the ones I was mentioning before. Uh, then, just for some food for thought, two possible aspects that have a big potential. That is to say the IMET uh, that was announced on the occasion of the Delhi G20 and which uh, uh, involves Italy, whose harbors might be important, uh, let's say, hubs and terminals of this corridor 
that will connect India to Europe through the Middle East. And of course, with all of the possible distinctions that need to be made in consideration of the current geopolitical situation. But as our potential, well, the potential remains uh, uh, the same. And then the outcomes of the negotiations between India and the EU on uh, the signing of a free trade agreement. India è un paese e un'economia ancora molto chiusa. L'apertura attraverso un FTA, soprattutto con. And also, uh, the agreement uh, would be important, it would be a game changer, giving important prospects. I stop here because I think I've spoken over uh, the time I was granted. Thank you. So, uh, thank you so much. And uh, now, well, uh, you've gone back to some uh, economic and financial aspects, and I would like to ask uh, Professor uh, Scamozzino to take the floor and make comments. Pasquale is a member of uh, the expert group of the observatory, and I also studied at the uh, African Studies School in London and now teaches at the Tavagata University of Rome. Please. Thank you, Sergio. Good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to thank Chespi and Grimaldi Alliance for organizing this event. Very useful. The Asian Development Bank, in particular, Matteo Lanzafame, for illustrating us the latest version of the outlook. If you allow me, the first time I met Matteo was at a conference some time ago. Matteo was a young, brilliant academic economist who was back from Kent for a PhD. And at that time, I was invited as a discussant to his presentation. And here we go again today. I will focus on India rather than commenting the outlook in general. We have seen some impressive data on uh, India's growth, growth rate around 7% per year, very high indeed. Some researchers are not 100% sure on the accuracy of these figures. Without giving you too many details, the index of nominal GDP is deflated by price indices to pass from face value to real value. In India, they tend to use more volatile prices, retail prices, rather than consumer prices. And this has determined a growth of real GDP very close to face GDP. They use consumer consumption price. When using consumption prices, figure is lower, but still 5%. The growth of Indian economy is linked to investments, as it has been said in particular, I would like to stress digital infrastructure's role. From a strategic viewpoint, they're crucial. And among positive aspects are the increase of currency values. However, there are some vulnerable aspects. In particular, good experts have diminished, have dropped. There's a deficit in the trade balance. Imports overcome exports by approximately 2% of GDP. There are some positive flows from migrants, the diaspora we were talking about. So 
deficit is lower compared to trade deficit because it reflects these incoming flows from migrants. However, India is structurally weak and this is a criticality. This is compensated by equity flows, capital flows that are very positive. If we look in detail, more in, in detail, the higher flows are portfolio rather than direct foreign investments. And these investments are the most volatile, the one that can become deflows very easily. Last week, the meeting was held in Washington at the International Monetary Fund with the governors of the main central banks, and a session was devoted to capital flows, and the governor of South African Reserve Bank was saying that when he talks with South African entrepreneurs, they say, yes, capital flows are important, we would like to have more. But when he speaks with his colleagues at the back, no, they say capital flows are very dangerous because they are extremely volatile. So we should be cautious. Capital flows should rather be long term rather than linked to portfolios. And then I'd like to stress some possible risks, some possible vulnerabilities in the longer term. A peculiarity of the recent development in India has been that of passing from an agricultural economy to a service economy, whereas the normal path in developing countries go passes through manufacture first. India focused on services. That's skipping the manufacturing phase. And this has allowed India to become a leader in some sectors, but there are some issues. Basically, employment, jobs generated by the service sector are fewer compared to jobs created by the manufacturing sector. And this was said also during the preliminary works for the outlook that are mentioned, that have been mentioned. When the manufacturing is expanding, employment increases more than what happens in the service sector. So we could have a sort of jobless growth a growth that does not translate into more jobs. This is a possible risk for Indian development. Then if we look at the structure of compared advantages, in the last decades, it has changed at present, the Indian economy has come advantages in advanced sectors from a technological viewpoint, uh, pharmaceutical industry, chemical industry, IT industry, and therefore, it is more competitive on international markets. But there are barriers, tariff barriers. India was, until the 80s, it was a closed country when the first reforms were put in place. In 
in the 90s, even thanks to the IMF, the then First Minister Samarau and the Ministry of Economy, who became First Minister, Prime Minister, reduced the tariffs substantially. And we have seen that those sectors where tariffs were reduced became more productive. And this was shown by some studies carried out with colleagues from the Asian Development Bank. So a reduction in tariffs brought about an increase in productivity in services. Not in service, says the speaker, but in those sectors where the tariffs were reduced. But at comparative level, tariffs to exports are still very high. And this has some implications in terms of protection of their own industries. So some researchers noticed that the productive system in India is characterized by some big groups, large groups, that are still very much protected and potentially they could exploit their position. And this could be a difficulty that should be tackled. And then more in general, these difficulties could be associated to the possibility that the ex exchange rate is more valid. The Reserve Bank of India has some rules of currency policy and inflation targeting. So an inflation objective and they adjust interest rates in order to reach this objective. So if inflation is more than exceeds the limit, the objective limit, the exchange rate are increased. If it's below, they are reduced. It's the Taylor rule adopted by most central banks in developed advanced countries. And it, it is adopted also by many emerging countries or developing countries. And there is a debate whether this is whether it is appropriate for emerging countries to use the same, to follow the same policy as the one used in advanced countries, if the current monetary policy should be more targeted to specific needs of a given country. There are other aspects that could be illustrated, for instance, public finances. It's true that deficit pub that has improved in the last years, but it's still present. In India, there's the interaction is difficult between central authorities and federal authorities. Some transfers are made from central government to the different states. There are some formulas that are followed, but the central government accommodate deficits of the various Indian states. And this is a gap filling practice. It's like a fiscal dentistry to fill the gaps of the various states. As to education, India has very important universities, for instance, the Indian Institute of Technology, the overrepresentation of Indians in ch as chief executive officers of the main global companies. Even the British Prime Minister is from Indian origin as well as many ministries in uh, the British cabinet. So Indian diaspora plays an important role. 
And next to these excellencies, there are still some critical situations as to education in general. So there are still some important differences and dualism in uh, uh, India between, for instance, rural areas and urban areas, and even differences from one state to another. There, are, we have very wealthy states in India and some poor states. When there are these differences, it can happen that states, less developed states, can grow faster than ad more advanced states, or less developed regions could uh, lag behind, farther behind, and this is what seems to happen in India. It seems that less developed states did not benefit from this growth. One last remark. concerning the Human Development Index by the United Nations that takes into consideration a number of indicator, indicators, economic indicators, as well as social indicators, educational indicators. The, the latest data from the Human Development Index is 0 0.64 in India. 100, ranking 134 out of 193 countries. So this Human Development Index is still quite low in India. India has not filled the gap with more advanced countries. Its position in the world ranking is just below Bangladesh and Iraq. It is true that India has grown in the last decades and it will probably continue to grow at a fast pace, but there are some critical elements in this growth. There are still, there are still differences, social differences and regional differences that are still present. Thank you, Pasquale. You remembered something important when talking about India or when talking about China and other countries, averages are important indicators, but still. We should not forget that there's a great deal of heterogeneity in these countries. There are many differences within a single country in this region. Maybe we have some time for questions or other remarks in the room, but also from those connected on Zoom. Andrea Cosentino, a financial think tank based in Rome and London, export driven by semiconductor is an important. What's the role of Taiwan? Are there other countries producing semiconductors of average or low quality? And then the role between BRICS Bank and Asian Bank. As to the second question, I can say I can't answer. I'm within the economy department, and these elements are faced by operations. Maybe Sergio can answer this question. IDB has institutional relations with a number of development banks and other international institutions. I don't know whether with this bank we have agreements, specific agreements, but basically there are no barriers, there are no hurdles to possible agreements. It depends on 
the issues we want to solve. If there's an opportunity for collaboration, we have no problems at all. When it comes to your first question, well, as I was saying, we have a special topic within the report. If you're interested, you can read that part of the report. What we see from data, well, this is due to the heterogeneity of production. You are talking about Taipei, China, but we can say Taiwan. The increase of these exports of semiconductor is driven by two main semiconductor, memory chip and microprocessors. Taipei China is specialized in the production of microprocessors, high-end, those used for training in artificial intelligence. However, this is not the most important part of semiconductors produced by Taipei China. They produce an other series of semiconductors. So we see an increase in exports concerning this economy, but the economy which benefited more from this change in cycle is South Korea. 80% of exports in South Korea of semiconductor are memory chips. The reason is that artificial intelligence needs both advanced high-end uh, microprocessors, but also a lot of memory compared to other technologies. This ongoing training of AI is done through a series of repetitions. And to do so, you need a lot of memory. These chips are produced at a global level, mainly in South Korea. So, so far, there is this uh, increase in exports driven by semiconductors. But if we look at the group of countries who produce 80% of chips at a global level, there are still huge differences from one country to another. Thank you. Are there other questions? I'd like to say something on the image uh, we got of India after these presentations. I'd like to go back to what Pasquale Scaramozzino was saying. And I'd like to add something to what he said. So, in general, the economic development in India is a low quality development. And the verb beyond growth and the very low quality was partly introduced by Pasquale when he said two important things the growth, the jobless growth, and the low level of human development. These are two aspects, but there are further aspects. For instance, 80% of work for Indian workforce is recruited through informal contracts, 80% with the agricultural sector with more than 90%. We can say that the employment model in India is mainly informal. What does it mean? It means that people are not well paid, they have low wages, they are precarious worker with no health coverage, with no social protection, and so on and so forth. Many books have been written about it. This is a first aspect, the economic development is reached to the detriment of some parts of the society. When talking about 80% of informal contracts, we are talking about almost every worker, with the exception of this, let's say, working aristocracy, that is to say, those working in the sectors indicated as 
driving sectors. Another aspect that is very important, well, this is revealed when assessing human development. When talking about human development index, we see a lot of distraction, we see life expectancy and revenues. And the main data, in my opinion, is life expectancy, the education level, and in India, the level of education is extremely low. It's true we have some very important institutes, but there are few. I mean, in India, you have one billion and a half people. They don't study all at the Indian Institute of Technology. Another aspect that we should take into consideration is that India is not investing in environment. This means that the economic growth in India is to the detriment of an environmental impact. And this is not true for China. China is reducing its growth rate, but they solved many environmental issues. If we look at BRICS, we see that out of all BRICS country, the only country who is not investing in environment is India. When asking these questions, I did a research. I went to India, to New Delhi. Anyway, I forgot who I talked to, but well, I was told when I asked the reasons for this difference between China and India, why is China investing in environment and India is not? I was told because China is not a democracy, so the government can do whatever he wants to do. Whereas in India, we have to convince our population. But if we look at the democracy they have in India, well, it's true that maybe India is the biggest democracy of the world, but no, I don't believe it. Microphone, please. We lost the speaker. We can't hear the speaker. Microphone, please. Thank you, Elisabetta. As Daniele was saying, any other questions? No, I'd like to thank Elisabetta for her observation that I totally share. Yes, it's a country that is still very poor. They are starting to grow. They have they still have issues to compare India to China today is not fair, maybe. I mean, China is growing at a lower rate, but they have grown at very high rate for 30 years. There's still some more to do. The development is less green compared to advanced countries, less green than China. So there are still many issues to be settled. But in the meantime, as Pasquale was saying before, this can we can use a different perspective. I mean, it's still a poor country. 40% of population are still working in agriculture. 80% of countries are informal. This is a disadvantage. But in the meantime, it's also an opportunity As we know, 
opportunities for India are huge. So it's an issue, but there are two faces for the same medal. Any other comment? Ah, Marcella, yes. Why? Sí. Well, these issues you were talking about are real. The fact that the economy is still closed despite of the, uh, let's say, openings we've had, this is also witnessed by the difficulties that the EU is encountering in uh, negotiating. And also there are large industrial groups that have a, a sort of oligopoly approach when it comes to the market because they do control huge sectors of activity and they don't have any particular interest so that India opens up to external competition. Uh, this is another fact. And also the fact that in uh, basic education, well, the situation is still backwarded and this is the result of a strategic choice which is made by the uh, that was made by the Prime Minister in the past. And, uh, uh, of course, there is the advanced, uh, let's say, education, and uh, then the basic education is uh, backwarded. And also, uh, the uh, social uh, situation is blocked at the moment. And uh, also for religious issues. And the system of, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the elite is still pervasive and uh, rigid. And this is another uh, factor uh, for uh, disparity and uh, the fact that there are still a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, imbalances and also we have uh, hastes and uh, there's a uh, uh, big divide between the very rich population and the very poor population. Um, and it's difficult to see a trend in terms of empowerment in the short term. A lot has been done so far, and uh, the uh, merits of this government need to be acknowledged. And uh, digital technologies was, were exploited you know, to reach out a large portion of the population uh, by means of a uh, proximity uh, welfare that allowed to have small amounts able to impact on the lifestyle of a lot of people and huge portions of population, and this continues to be a trend. And also inclusion, financial inclusion, which has undergone uh, a huge, uh, let's say, peak. But we've not witnessed that passage from inclusion to empowerment. So this has not been done, and this has not, let's say, uh, triggered any growth. Another important factor is the demographic one, because some say that uh, India is going through a demographic divide, but it's also true And uh, employing young people is, uh, let's say, uh, quite difficult. We're talking about 10, 20 million young people that are on the labor market each and every year. And this magnitude is impressive. And also, therefore, the importance of uh, considering migrations. Because, of course, um, the higher number of labor force India uh, sends to foreign markets, the lower uh, the domestic pressure, and this has been uh, mentioned also in terms of uh, importance of remittances that are sent. So that is the reason why the migration policy becomes a fundamental pillar when it comes to bilateral relations involving India. So this is definitely true, and it must be kept into consideration. In addition, with uh, the fact that this has been uh, defined as the bluff of democracy. It's not true that India grows less fast than China, or less effectively than uh, uh, China. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is uh, 
Well, what is slowing down the growth of India, from my point of view, is uh, the lack of democracy that still remains in the country, and also corruption and social immobility, also supported by, uh, for instance, uh, the religious approach and uh, uh, the uh, strong relations between economic power and political power. So. Um, this, of course, creates some resistance that slows down the uh, development of India and its progress towards a direction that will be uh, the one wished for. Then we may also say whether this is a good thing or not. But, generally speaking, we're coming to the philosophical approach and uh, it's not uh, the right occasion. Okay, thank you, and I forgot to, th to thank you uh, because that was mentioned at the beginning, but that's late in the evening for you, so thank you so much for being with us. Just one remark. Uh, I wouldn't idealize uh, China versus India. And I was uh, uh, struck by uh, the fact that there's a deficit of the trade balance in China because China exports a lot of uh, goods and uh, this is done uh, through dumping and it causes difficulty and China is not able to develop the internal domestic demand because a country managed by communism where well, there's no welfare. And in India, are we sure that the model of uh, uh, the, the economic model of last century adopted by the West, like Germany, France, Italy, is still current and is still strong, because um, I'm wondering whether the fact that India is not willing to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, be a competitor of China and it's relying on services or advanced technologies, or pharmaceutical sector, or advanced services, or the cinema. Are we sure that this is an error? Well, thank you. That's my comment. Thank you. Well, uh, a lot of topics have been, uh, let's say, raised, and uh, I think we will, uh, of course, uh, develop further all of them in the next few weeks. Pasquale? I may uh, quickly answer to your comment. The distinction between uh, agriculture, industry, services, it's a historical distinction, and we should redefine these categories. But I believe there are some differences between the different uh, uh, productive activities. The last time I went to UK, a couple of weeks ago, I uh, went, for instance, uh, uh, to a store and uh, I, I went to the stationer's shop and uh, everything was from China. Whereas when I call my bank, uh, the person that answers the phone was, is clearly from China, from India. So it's clear, those that work in call centers and what is the level of satisfaction they can have? Um, well, they need to answer the phone, they have to provide a, a service and they can be easily replaced. So also in the case of services, we should think about high quality services instead of routine services that are not entirely meeting the needs of this young uh, and growing uh, population that India has. Thank you. All right. So at this point, I would like to close the meeting. And I wanted to thank once again uh, the uh, um, Grimaldi and uh, Chespi for organizing this meeting and all of you for your participation. Uh, today we're taught about GDP, but we also uh, mentioned different topics that we will uh, resume soon. When it comes to GDP, well, Matteo showed a chart with the volumes and how the volume is growing when it comes to the uh, GDP by India. 
And this is very important to understand the role that the economy plays and might have in the future within the region. And uh, with a view to this meeting, I've also had the chance and the pleasure to exchange some ideas with Matteo, who showed me a chart, it's not here, it's very interesting, on the per head GDP, which is, of course, a um, very important indicator which reflects the well-being and the, the situation of uh, well-being of citizens in a given country. And also the uh, China versus India gap is broad and uh, per head GDP, also with the caveats that Pasquale mentioned, uh, uh, is growing and uh, there's a gap. However, that still needs to be bridged. And uh, not to mention the items that you've raised. So by way of conclusion, India will be uh, uh, always, uh, let's say, involved in part of our future. Uh, and it has to, uh, let's say, gain ground on several areas, but we would like to uh, uh, understand and uh, help as much as possible others to understand and this is the main purpose of our observation.